But this was asked in a quant interview, surprisingly. Or maybe unsurprisingly, because a lot of people actually screw it up. What's up guys, Coding Jesus here. And in today's video, I wanna talk about the top three C++ pitfalls. Now, these aren't the most dangerous pitfalls, they're just the most common ones that I've seen as a developer and as a site owner. Now, how do I determine what's common and what's not? Well, I have a site called getcrack.io, I have over 80,000 users on it, and I have a ton of different coding problems in Python, Rust, and C++. And so I can see the success rates of these problems and their difficulty levels. And then I can extract the relevant concepts under test to tell you guys where people are failing so that you guys don't fail yourself. So where are people failing? What I'm noticing is that a lot of people are failing on the simplest problems with the lowest success rates. So we have a very simple problem, and it just so happens that a lot of people are screwing up, leading to low success rates. Now, why is that the case? I don't know. Maybe people are learning incorrectly, and maybe they're skipping the fundamentals and going straight to advanced concepts. It's kind of difficult to tell. Regardless, let's talk about these three things. And to be frank, they're kind of basic. So hopefully by the end of this, you've learned something as well. The first one is object construction, right? The most basic part of a program. How do we create an object? When is it destroyed? How do we copy it? How do we assign it? A lot of people are screwing up here, surprisingly. So let's take a look. So as you can see, we have this problem on the right. I titled it 96% of you will fail this, and it just so happened that 94% of people failed this. I was pretty close on the guess. So let's take a look at the problem. We'll take a look at the answer, and then we'll explain why along the way. So we have a very simple object called OBJ or object, whatever you want to call it, has a constructor, copy constructor, and copy assignment operator. Usually copy assignment operators need to return a object reference, but because I'm never actually using it and the function signature does not include the return type, I just put it as void. Okay, let's go down from top to bottom, looking at the lines in main, and asking ourselves what gets printed. All right, the first one should be extremely obvious. If you screw it up here, you need to revisit how you've been learning C++. Learn CPP is a great resource. This calls a constructor. The next one, brace initialization, constructor. The third one, this is where things get tricky. This is called the most vexing parse in C++. Now, what, what is that? Well, what that states is that anything that can be interpreted as a function declaration will. So line three is actually saying we have a function declaration called C, uh, with a function name called C, that takes in nothing and returns a type object. All right, so nothing is printed here. What about the next line? This is where a lot of people screw up as well. Think really, really, really strongly here. Okay, this is a copy constructor. It's not the assignment operator. A lot of people see the equal sign and just jump to the assignment operator. It's, that's not it. The assignment operator is only used when you're not creating an object. You're assigning object A to object B, and B already exists. And that's exactly what happens on the next line. Okay, what about E? E might be a little tricky as well, but what you're essentially doing is calling objects constructor on E. The way that I like to see it is that E is exactly like A, except we decided to type more and put the object's type on the right-hand side of the assignment operator. So that's just the constructor. Then we have F. F is a clear example of a copy constructor. G is a clear example of a copy constructor. H is a clear example of a copy constructor. It's the same as D equals A on line four. The only difference is we use auto instead of object. And the last one gets people to, um, the last one's a little tricky. This is actually just a constructor. You didn't need to add the parentheses. You could have just had it had a space in between I and object. This is just initializing an object called i of type obj. Okay, now that we understand that, let's move on to a question that was asked in a Microsoft interview submitted by a user on the platform. This one's really interesting too because it has a 25% success rate. Now this one is also what you've learned and putting it into practice. Okay, it's really simple. It's just three lines of, or four lines of code. You're allocating an array on the stack you're iterating over the object in the array, and you're calling a method, right? So what's going on here? Well, what we initially do is we allocate, right? We construct two objects. Those print one, one. The next thing that we do is we iterate, right? So because we're taking auto, 
by non-const non-reference, we're creating a copy. So two gets printed, and then three gets printed in the loop. Now, if there was a destructor in this problem, the destructor would run because the copy arrives at the end of its scope. So its lifetime is now destroyed. Now we go to the next object in that array, right? Or the last object. We call the copy constructor. We create a copy from it. We call F, and then it gets destroyed, and then the array is deallocated because we end, we, we fall out, out of main, right? So hopefully that's clear. So this is a first category of pitfall that people usually run into. The next one has to do with types. Now, there's a lot we can talk about here. The, the four things I want to really cover is representation, conversion, empty types, and overload resolution. All right? So let's take, it, let's take a look. So here's a problem. Don't get overwhelmed because there's a lot of words on the screen. It's actually quite simple. We have a single type, right? int x, and it's an array that contains five integers, and each integer is four bytes. Now, imagine that this array is allocated at address zero, all right? At what address would I land on if I did both of these two operations? The first is ampersand x plus one, the second is x plus one. So think about it, because I'm going to tell you the answer and why. So in the first example, we're taking the address of an array of integers that contains five elements. When we add one to it, we add five times four because there's five elements in the array and each array is four, and each element is four bytes. So we end up at address 20. In the second operation though, we have X, which is an array, but because we're not taking the ampersand operator, when we do that plus one, we have that array decay to a pointer and we add one. So that's a, that's a int pointer and because an int is four bytes, and we add one to it, it's one times four. That plus one is times the size of the element contained in the array. So the answer is 20 comma four. All right, this tests a couple of things. Your understanding of types, your understanding of pointers, your understanding of array decay to pointer. And as you can see, it only has a 12% success rate. But this was asked in a quant interview, surprisingly. Or maybe unsurprisingly, because a lot of people actually screw it up. This is a tricky problem, but it's still classified as an easy problem. As you can see, it has a 17% success rate. Now, this problem tests a lot of different things that I'm going to be diving into. So if you want to think about the answer, pause the video first. All right. We have a class called Fahrenheit that has a default constructor and a converting constructor. Converts from double to Fahrenheit. Okay. We then have room temperature that contains two member variables, internal and external. There's a couple of questions that should be running through your head at this moment. The first is, which order are member variables initialized in? The second one is, if external is not part of the member initialization list, does its default constructor get called or not? Let's answer those one by one. The first answer is, they're initialized in order of declaration. So internal will be initialized and then external. Now, what's going to happen in terms of externals default constructor. Will it be called or will it not be called? Well, let's start with internal first. Internal is initialized with a double as part of the member initialization list and therefore only B gets called. Before the body of room temperature runs, external also gets initialized. It's default constructor it's called. It's omission from the member initialization list does not mean that it is not constructed before the body runs. So A is printed. And then we actually reset external by assigning it the number three, which calls the converting constructor from double. So B is printed. So what we get here is B, A, B. This next one's kind of funny, right? This next one's kind of funny because we're talking about overload resolution. Now, this is really important, right? This is really important in C++ because sometimes you want to pass in a double to a method that has the same name, right? I think Rust does not allow overloading, so it requires you to have a different name. Instead of foo for the short, it'd have to have bar. But in C++ and many other languages, you have overloading. So if I pass in zero here, right, I have foo of const char star and foo of short, what gets called? Pause and think. Zero is an integer. An integer is neither a short nor a const char star. So what C++ will do is it'll try to pick which one to call, but before it does that, it builds an overload resolution set, okay? That set contains all viable overloads, whereby C++ picks the best one. 
Now, best can be defined technically. There's many steps it goes through, and there's a lot of criteria. But I think the most important heuristic here is to understand that it will try to attempt to do the least amount of implicit conversions. It'll try to do the least amount of conversions, right? And it just so happens that going from zero to const char star is one conversion, and going from zero to short is one conversion. And because they both require one conversion, the call to foo zero is ambiguous. The compiler does not know which one to pick. So the end result is a compilation error. It's neither one nor two. All right, now let's talk about templates. Okay, this is the third category of a common pitfall. And the first example in this category is actually quite funny. So we have two developers that write a templated stack class. They both claim their implementation is right, and the others won't compile. Whose code will compile? So we have dev1 that writes a stack class, but he doesn't actually use t, right? He makes a stack cons a copy constructor, but he doesn't use t in it. And then we have dev2 that also writes the exact same stack templated class, but instead in the copy constructor, he references t. All right, so who's right here? Are they both right? Are none of them right? Is one or the other right? Now, they're actually both right. Both of these are fine. Both of, these, both of their code will compile. That's the question, whose code will compile? The reason that they're both fine is that inside the template class, you don't actually need to specify t. You can if you want to, but most people will generally omit it because it'll just add clutter without actually providing any useful information. So um, inside the class, you don't need it. If you, however, decide to define this copy constructor outside of stack, then you need it. So you need it in the actual definition. In the declaration, you don't. This one's interesting because this tests a couple of things. Your understanding of specialization, your understanding of which function call will be picked. Which one has more priority? A print statement that's a template, a print statement that's a specialization of a template, or a print statement that is not a template at all? This is the general idea here. The C++ standard states that when there is a more specialized version of a function, the more specialized version is used, right? So in some cases, the non-templated version of print is selected. Um, in the second and third calls to print, we're explicitly asking for a templated version of print. Uh, in the last version, print double, that obviously defaults to the generic print template, so one is printed, since we don't have a specialization for double. And then in the first one, print zero without any angled brackets, we are simply calling print that doesn't have anything to do with templates, so it prints three. So we have three, two, two, one, that's the output. Okay, now this question is very interesting. It's not interesting because somebody's gonna ask you this in an interview. It's interesting because it contrasts your understanding of what happens between runtime and compile time. In other words, what's the behavior of virtual functions and what's the behavior of template functions? And I'm gonna let you guys do this one on your own. Now, everything that I've showed you guys up till now has been relatively easy problems. And these are the most common pitfalls, but don't get overconfident if you've gotten them all right, because there are tons and tons of other questions that are available on my platform, getcrack.io. And guys, half the platform is free. So there's around 900 problems, 450 of them are totally free, and you can use them to sharpen your skill set. Now, these aren't only multiple choice questions in Rust, Python, and C++. I also have coding related problems. And in fact, this problem that you're looking at on your screen is one that was asked to a friend of mine at Citadel. He got asked at Citadel Securities, how do you implement Studeny? And the interviewer had him do it there on the spot and he totally crashed out. So if you're looking for that practice, this is a platform for you. And why is this a lot gonna be a lot more important than Leet Code or whatever moving forward? A lot of companies, especially in the age of AI, they're moving away from the standard DSA, chat gpt -able sort of questions to the knowledge round. That might look like, tell me what the rule of five is, or it might look like, implement stud any for me. Because they want to see your thought process as you move through these problems, because not a, not a lot of them have like an easy, straightforward answer, right? There isn't like the most optimal solution in most cases. They're looking to see how you think and how you vocalize, because that's what you're actually going to be doing on the job. And that's the direction that a lot of companies are moving towards. So make sure to check out getcrack.io, guys. It's totally free.
If you'd like to support the channel, consider becoming a patron. You get Discord access. Consider also becoming a channel member. You get a cool little badge. When I go live, you can access cool emojis and just generally support what's going on on this channel. Like the video if you found it useful, guys. Thank you for watching. Cheers.